Okay, just to, you know, of course, as you all know, I'm the llama person. And so, you know, these are some things I've learned through the years, through research and, uh, you know, just having llamas for 20 years. Uh, you know, they have fiber and they have great personality. You know, if you're going to use all of them, you need to, you know, you need to clean out the barn. So then comes the manure. But um, anyway, we're the Walnut Ridge Llama Farm and Lazy Llama Campground. And llamas are the anchor of everything we do here. And um, and it really, the last few years, the manure has become a more um, an important part of what we do. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through all this, but we have over 50 llamas. We do all kinds of things: spooky llama trails and tales, home for the holidays, Christmas with the Kriyas, art at the llama farm. Now, during the art at the llama farm, it's for kids and adults. Uh, we, we can't have it this year because of the virus, but uh, anyway. Um, uh, we teach gardening uh, to the kids. That's part of what we do. So they uh, they enjoy that. We enjoy doing it with them. And then, of course, the llama store and llama dirt. Uh, we call it llama dirt or it's composted llama manure. One new thing I didn't put on here, but we're going to open a coffee house. We're going to call it the Lazy Llama Cafe. And uh, so we're going to do activities with llamas and make a coffee house that the local folks plus the campers can come to. Uh, this is Carolyn's studio. Uh, we built it. Uh, actually, I did an agritourism uh, grant for $15,000 and got it back in 2005. And we, of course, this cost about $60,000 to build, but I got $15,000 back in, in a refund for that. Uh, this is our to llama farm camp. You know, see the kids working with the llamas. They teach them how to, you know, do uh, go through an obstacle course, and they all actually the kids every year they halter train our babies, and we delivered five babies today to Burnsville, North Carolina. And it's always sad when babies leave the farm, but uh, they went to a great place. People have an Airbnb, so they're going to have llamas as part of the uh, attraction. Uh, History of llamas, this is real, to me, is real interesting because I'm a history nut, but uh, llamas are native to South America and they've been bred for thousands of years by the indigenous people in South America. Uh, today, uh, llamas uh, today's llamas belong to the camelid family. Their evolution, however, began in North America, not South America. And actually, they found camelid bones at the gray fossil site, uh, just uh, about 15 miles from my house. So now we say that uh, we're just bringing llamas back to Tennessee uh, when we first started the farm. But anyway, the camelids uh, migrated to South America during the Ice Age and the Andean and Inca Empire over 6,000 years ago. They were very specific on their selective breeding of llamas for gentleness and that which made them the safest and easiest uh, animals to train pack lamp pack animals in the world. Llamas and alpacas were raised for meat, wool production, transportation was the biggest thing that they did, and compost for crops approximately 2,500 years ago. So the Inca Indians actually did composting, uh, you know, so they could uh, grow vegetables for the growing empire. The Inca culture, um, who had not discovered the wheel, relied on the llama to carry trade goods and produce and military supplies throughout their empire. And uh, so llamas were elevated to a, a very high uh, status in, this, in the uh, culture of the Inca empire. Now, when the Spaniards came in and conquered the Incas, the first thing they did was start killing all the llamas and alpacas. And the reason they did that was because the economy of the natives depended on llamas and alpacas. And uh, by them killing their economy, then they were able to more easily conquer them. The only ones to survive uh, that uh, killing, uh, they were forced to move into the desert of the high mountains, about 12,000 to 14,000 feet high above sea level. And um, those of you that, if you know anything about history and, and pl different places in the world, this is, of course, is Machu Picchu. And if you will look at all of the terraced areas there, that is llama and alpaca compost from thousands of years ago. What they did, uh, that was nothing but a rocky 
scraggly place. Uh, nothing grew up there because look at the surrounding around that green area. It's all rock. So what they did, they had teams of llamas that were tied to each other and they, they might have hundreds of llamas on the trail and they had huge packs on their back uh, full of llama and alpaca manure that, or compost that they hauled up to this place. That are, So they would build with rock, they would build these terraces and they'd fill it with that type of soil from, uh, you know, down in the, uh, the uh, Inca communities. So they don't really know what this was, but they think that it was a summer home for probably some royalty. And there's a better uh, view of uh, the different terraces. So you can imagine strings of hundreds of llamas with these huge packs on their back, bringing, uh, uh, they call it Andean gold, which was compost uh, of llamas and alpacas up to, up to this place. Um, recent, ha uh, recent history, uh, llamas, all of our llamas come from Peru, Bolivia, Chile, uh, which they don't show on here, or, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Chile, and one more, Argentina. And I can trace my llama's heritage back to what country th their uh, ancestors came from because it's they're all registered. So we know most of my llamas are Chilean. I have one Argentine that is really cool. We love him. And uh, the Argentines are a little bit different looking than all of the others, but we breed him to some of our other females. But anyway, recent history, uh, the llamas were brought back to North America in the late 1800s. Uh, they were in zoos, animal parks, and they were owned by uh, exotic collectors. But in 1930, uh, importation was banned because of the foot and mouth disease in South America, so they wouldn't allow them to bring any more in. The ban was lifted in 1984 and the llama craze was in full swing. Uh, there's an estimated 200,000 llamas living in the USA today. Uh, the last, seemed like the last 10 years, that number has gone down. Um, but so a lot of people are trying to buy llamas. I get no teasing. I get two to four calls a week, people wanting llamas, but they're hard to find, come by now. Uh, but with that many llamas around, their manure is quickly becoming a prized compost in the age of organic and green gardening. Uh, this is, hostas love llama compost. So this is some of the hostas around our house. And this was, I started just planting these. We started making, underneath all those hostas, we just, you know, started putting some of our llama manure in that we composted a little bit. And they started growing like crazy. There's a close-up uh, of what we did. Now this is llama beans. They're non-edible. We actually are going to put llama beans in our new cafe. We're going to get chocolate covered raisins and, pe and peanuts and sell them <laughs> as llama beans. And uh, people will buy them for, I'm sure, to you know, take home with them and share them with their family and friends. But uh, the beans, uh, uh, llamas are communal pottiers, which means they, they poop in certain areas. They don't just, you know, a goat or sheep or, you know, a cow. It's just wherever they get the urge. They just, you know, droppings everywhere. With llamas, they have certain areas either in the barn or I wish it wouldn't be in the barn, but or in different parts of the pasture that they will use the bathroom. And unlike the loose, crumbly or wet manure of cows and horses, llama manure comes in these real hard pellets. And those pellets, plaque, uh, they pack plenty of nitrogen and they need to be aged or composted. Now you can actually put these beans raw around your plants and they will slowly leach out nutrients. They will not burn your plants, which is amazing. Uh, the manure from llamas is typically collected together with their bedding material or straw, which provides the carbon source, which is needed to balance their nitrogen content. And if you have the bedding, which we do, uh, from llamas in the compost pile, you automatically have a compost pile. Now I do a combination of aging and composting. Now aging manure simply means you just let it sit. Over time, the nitrogen content volatile, volatilizes, that's hard to say, which means it converts to a gaseous form and enters the atmosphere, leaving the poop cooler than it was first deposited. So it gets less hot as it, you know, as it composts. 
the other part is at age. The other thing is composting, which means piling up the manure, alternating layers of carbon-rich substances such as leaves or straw, grass clippings, and you keep it moist and aerate until the pile decomposes into just crumbly dirt. But I just uh, take mine out of the barn, we pile it right outside the barn, then I'll take my front end loader, take it out to a certain place away from the barn, and I'll pile it up. It'll be, I mean, it'll be, uh, you know, six, seven feet high. And then I would, a couple of times during the winter, I'll just, on a dry day, if I can find one, I'll just take my front end loader and then just turn it a little bit, you know, just pick it up and let it drop back down. The great thing about pellets is that you, some people say they're SH blank blank don't stink. Llama SH blank blank does not stink. It, it has very, very little odor. The only thing, and those llamas themselves have no odor. The only thing that you smell in a barn with llamas basically is urine. And, uh, but you won't smell the, uh, the poop. Now this is how to use llama manure. It's sometimes called llama beans. It's used as uh, a potassium, nitrogen, and phosphorus-rich organic fertilizer in gardens and flower beds. Um, I have people that get manure from me or compost from me all the time. And as one guy told me last year, he, he built some box gardens and did it for the first time. He said, it's like tomatoes on steroids. Uh, I do no fertilizing in my garden other than this. I use no commercial fertilizer. Unlike fertilizer sprays and sticks, the llama manure is earth friendly and reduces your carbon footprint by recycling a part of nature. It has the added benefit, again, as I said before, of being odor free. You can either gather it yourself from llamas, you don't, you know, you don't walk around behind them with a bag, but you know, the <laughs> nice thing is that they, you know, they do it in piles, so you can go pick up the piles and put in a wheelbarrow uh, or whatever you want to do. And uh, you use it as is to improve your soil and provide plants with much needed nutrients. One thing it really does, it really holds the moisture. Uh, in, in my box gardens, uh, the top will be dry. You can take your hand anytime during the year and you can just dig down three to four inches. It never gets hard and uh, you can see the moisture underneath the top of it. Advantages of the compost. It works as a fertilizer and soil enhancer. It's nutrient rich and odor free, improves the physical structure of the soil, increase organic content and increases bacterial activity of the soil. It's great for green garden. I don't call it organic cause that brings a whole new, another set of criteria. It nourishes your plants, improves the structure of the soil. It's good for indoor and outdoor plants. Uh, compared to other barnyard animals, it's one of the highest in nutrient value. It will not burn plants like most manures. It can be composted or the beans can be made into llama poo tea. Uh, what you can do is get a cup full of llama beans, you put them in a recycle a milk jug, um, put it, uh, fill it full of water, set it out in the sun for uh, about a week, and then you can pour it on your indoor or outdoor plants. And of course, since it has no odor, it will not smell with your indoor plants. Uh, this is the animal manure comparison. Uh, just, you, you know, as you can look down through there, uh, llama has a high nitrogen content. There's your phosphorus and potassium. And just, you know, you can compare them as you look down through there. Sheep is real high in nitrogen. Um, I decided, of course, I was a high school principal, so, you know, I really love to garden. My grandmother taught me how to garden, and I really wanted to start doing it again, but I didn't have time to do a, a, a large garden. So in 2013, I decided to build some um, boxes, box gardening. And so I used 100%. I put the, the boxes on top where here, I'd go down a little bit, I'd just dig it out and throw, throw the topsoil away. This topsoil is terrible on the, this section where I have this box garden because it's on a uh, shale ridge. And so your topsoil is very shallow. So anyway, I put 100% llama compost in these boxes. And this was first time I ever did it. So I got these plants. I think I got them from the co-op 
and I planted, I just thought I'd just do brassicas. So look at it. This is the broccoli. No fertilizer whatsoever. Look at the cabbage. Brussels sprouts. Uh, we would put llama dirt uh, around, we'd ring our trees with it. Now, when I retired a couple of years ago, last year I decided I want to start gardening again, but I didn't have much time. So what I did, I went down to the campground and we have a nice flat area down there and I decided to make a campground garden. So all the campers could get involved. And I have a lot of people that, you know, stay there monthly, or I've had uh, two or three people that stayed more than a year. And so some of them helped me uh, do it. And I, and so during, I do all the planning. They, they, some of them donate a plant here and there, but uh, once we, I put it in, then they help me keep it weeded and they can get tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, corn, beans, whatever we plant, they can go down and, 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 get the produce from it as part of being a camper. So this is when we first started. First season. This was, when we did this, this was late May. This was about now we started doing this. So it took us about two weeks to put all the boxes in. And again, all I did, uh, that's a regular topsoil. Uh, we, uh, again, I had someone to come in with a tractor uh, with the, one of those tillers behind and just till it up. And then we built the boxes on top. And right there, uh, I, uh, before we build another uh, box, then I would bring my tractor and I just dump a load of llama compost in the box. So it's, again, 100% llama compost. I mean, look, I mean, it took off. The flowers you see on the left, we decided to make a monarch, a monarch uh, butterfly way station. Now, I need to get my sign. I need to order my sign. You have to buy those. So I, do, I did everything it takes to be certified. And those are coming up this year. And I forgot what they all were. My tags, somebody was helping me clean out the garden. They was out there clean. They threw all my tags away, but I found them in my compost bin. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to put little permanent tags down there once they bloom so I can remember what they are. But right now they're just coming up as plants for the, you know, because they're perennials. I mean, just look at it. I mean, it just took off. Uh, of course, that's okra right there. And I've got uh, um, um, watermelon on the other side of it. And on each side of the garden, I put zinnias out and I put some, uh, I, I saw a bag of um, wildflower seeds at um, Lowe's. So I brought that home and sprinkled. And all I did was till in each side uh, about a, a two feet wide and from one end to the other. And I just scattered, someone gave me some zinnia seeds. I just scattered it all in there and I stepped on it. That's all I did and walked across it. And they came up like crazy. I mean, look at that. And I've done this, I just planted them a few days ago. Same thing again. I saved the seeds. And there is a grub. I, I was looking for, for days for one of them little boogers to show up and it finally did. Now that's on a milkweed. So I got a tropical milkweed plant and we put two of them out and they found it. And this is, uh, um, I just got it and put it in a bowl. I actually sold this stuff by the pack back in 2000, I don't know, 10, 11, 12. We'd go to, we'd go to uh, festivals and I'd, I would uh, screen it through, just through a screen. I'd put the uh, compost on top and we'd, this was screened compost and I'd sell it in quart bags for $5 a bag. I'd sell a gallon for 10 and a bucket for five, because it didn't have to do any people come out and get buckets, but we sold it. Uh, and we sold a bunch of it, but I just don't have time for that anymore. So now we sell it by the, by the front end loader. 
but that's what it looks like. Now, I just pulled that out last night and got that picture. I still got bags down in my basement. And we call it llama dirt. So, uh, you know, it was, and we couldn't say it was organic. We said all natural. So you got to be careful. You can't label things organic unless you go through certain criteria. But that's what, a that's the bag I actually opened up and pulled it out. And it's just as fresh as it was before. It's really cool. And uh, and that's you can just read that. I mean, that's I just made that label to put on it. My dad told me if I could sell llama sh blank blank, I could sell anything. So uh, questions. <laughs>